So, my name is Angelo. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, one of the uh, open source projects that I've been working on at Facebook. So, a small, a small introduction about myself. Uh, this is a speech of me on one of our data centers, having some affair with my dev server. Um, so, I am a production engineer. If you are familiar with uh, positions like uh, SRE in Google, like Site or the Engineering, or uh, DevOps, this, basically we are a hybrid between um, software developers and, and, and people like operation engineers, basically. Um, so our focus is reliability, performances. We engage with the uh, software developers to make sure that uh, they are, uh, you know, their software will run at our scale. We, we basically like, we are two, tipos, two, two types of uh, production engineering team. Uh, one type is embedded production engineers. There are people that are embedded in product teams, like the newsfeed or the photos team. And we basically engage with them. We make sure that um, uh, their software can operate at our scale. Then there is another type of production engineer, which, which is 100% production engineers. And this is my, like, my team is 100% production engineers. That means we write the code, we support the code, we deploy the code, etc. I joined uh, around 2011, so like five years ago, more or less in Dublin. Uh, my first team was uh, called Site Reliability Operation. Uh, we are basically the first uh, people responding to incidents at Facebook. So we needed to watch everything around the infrastructure from the website to the API for the mobile phones, you know, storage, photos, anything. It was pretty scary if you, <laughs> those two years were pretty scary. I was basically watching the site alone on, over the weekends and millions of people would you know, rely on me watching the site. But eventually, we managed to automate ourselves out of the job using Python. Uh, we wrote a tool called FBAR, Facebook Auto Remediation, uh, which is a tool that uh, uh, was scanning uh, our alerting system, finding like, all the alerts and trying to remediate them automatically. Eventually, the, the team was closed. And you know, this is what you want. You want to automate your job. So most of us uh, joined different teams. And I joined the cluster infrastructure team. Um, so my team basically owns uh, data center core services. For that, I mean services like DHCP, TFTP, DNS, LDAP, stuff like that. Uh, anything basic that you need to run hardware, uh, computers at scale. Um, we do that with automation. Uh, we use heavily Python, some C++ as well. Uh, and we basically are responsible for one of the things we are responsible about is making sure that you can install operating systems on tens of thousands of servers, and you can do that basically with no human intervention. Uh, we also own automation to uh, bring up capacity and decommission capacity. That is basically Python automation to make sure that when you have a new cluster made of tens of thousands of servers, you can press a button and everything will happen, uh, all the machines will be configured, all the backends will know about this new cluster, etc. Who knows about this? We have seen this before. <laughs> yeah, so there is no cloud. Like, there is just other people's computers, right? So raise your hand if you work in a data center environment or you own some physical infrastructure. All right, just a few people. <laughs> anyway, like, this talk would be interesting also, only, like, also if you, uh, deal with, you don't deal with hardware because it can give you an overview of uh, what you need to do to you know, make sure that you can deploy those servers. And, yeah, somebody needs to uh, provision them. Um, so I wanted to say that we also run container infrastructure at Facebook, but you know, my team is responsible for making sure that the hardware that runs the containers can be automatically deployed. So we built something like an AWS like in-house. In this is a, an open compute server. Uh, it's an old one from 2012, I think. Um, Facebook runs this, uh, this non-profit organization. Actually, it doesn't run. It, it is part of a board of Open Compute. It's our open source initiative for data center and uh, server design. We open source designs on how we do data center, electrical systems, you know, how we design our motherboard and stuff like that. So you can check it out on the internet. So my, my team is responsible for installing this automatically. And we have many, many of them. We have many data holes like this, each made of many, many racks. And we have buildings like this. Um, this is a picture from uh, one of our data centers in Sweden, up in the polar circle. 
Uh, this is a picture of uh, when you know it, it was being uh, built. We have a second building now, exactly like this one, or similar to this one. And we have many, like some of them around the world. We have a few in the US. We have one in Eurio, which is our first uh, physical data center out, outside of the US. And we are just in the process of building one in Dublin. In addition to that, we also have many POPs around the globe. Um, we need POPs or point of pres presence to uh, make the user experience faster. We want to be as close as possible to the end users. Uh, the location of these POPs is totally random, by the way. Uh, we don't have any in Africa, right? Or maybe we have a few, but anyway. So the, basically what we, like the mantra is this, hands-free provisioning, right? And you know, you can't have people physically go, go around with USB sticks or CD-ROMs around the data center to install like tens of thousands of server, servers. Um, and provisioning is complex. There's many, many, many different uh, um, variables at play. There is like a version of the OS, different versions of the initRD, different version of the kernel. If your stack is v6 only or before, dual stack with v6. If you're dealing with a BIOS machine or a UFI machine, which bootloader you're using, IBXC, Grub2, uh, which server type you're, you're deploying, uh, you know, all of these components. But today I'm going to talk about TFTP. So, <laughs> TFTP, like in 2016, what the hell? Like, can it not use HTTP? Come on. Well, like, it is still used. It's not used on the open internet, of course, because it's very, like, unsafe. But uh, it's very, very used in uh, data center environment and ISP environments. The reason is, it's a simple protocol. The, diff the you know, specification of the protocol are very simple. We can write something yourself in maybe like one week, two weeks, if you want to support uh, different RFCs. So it's easy to implement. And it's UDP-based. UDP uh, that means that you don't need a full TCP IP stack, which means the code you produce, uh, it's very small. And that means that you can burn this into small chipsets. So, like, think about network card chipset and stuff like that. And because of that, usually it's used in embedded devices and you know network equipment. And uh, TFTP is used traditionally with the DHCP as a way to net boot, net bootstrap a machine from the network. Uh, some people say, why don't you you know burn IPXC directly on the chips? We, we could do that, but it doesn't work at our scale because we want to try different versions of uh, network boot programs or you know, IPX and Grab. And to do that, we want to be able to chain load over the network a new version of the, of the, of the uh, boot order so we don't actually uh, burn IPX on or any, any boot order on chipsets. All right, so this is an overview of um, how the provisioning phase works. It's divided in three parts, you know, power on the machine, uh, there is a netboot phase, which we're going to go in detail uh, later. After you get, you, know, you get your network configuration, you download your init RD and your kernel, you bootstrap from there. From there. We use uh, CentOS, so RPM-based um, operating system. And in this system, usually you have Anaconda. Anaconda will uh, download the Kickstarter files and you know, do all the things that it needs to do, so formatting drives, partitioning, installing RPMs, configuring a network, whatever. After that, it will reboot, and then we run Chef. Chef will basically converge the machine into the state we want. After that, if Chef runs, uh, you know, exit with status code of zero, it, we, we just mark the, the machine as provisioned, uh, which means it can, you know, potentially take a production traffic. So if you look into the netboot phase, it's divided in three parts. There is a DHCP phase uh, at the beginning where the machine doesn't have any network configuration, needs to fetch the configuration, typically stuff like uh, IP, uh, default gateway, netmask, DNS, uh, and we also pass uh, the location of the network bootloader. We use both DHCP v4 and v6 depending on the on the on the cluster we are in, we are in the, basically now every new cluster that we turn up, it's single stack v6 only. There is no v4 at all. This had its own problem. We worked on that like for two years, and but now we basically have no problem at all with it. We can bring up clusters in v6 only environments. All the software is v6 only. Um, anyway, you get your um, the location of your network boot program, then the the, the NIC card will download the network boot program and start it and the network boot program itself will use TFTP 
Uh, so the download happens actually over TFTP. I didn't mention that, but yeah. Um, then the network boot program will uh, download its configuration, typically via, via uh, TFTP. It can do HTTP if it's a new recently, like recent bootloader. Um, and you can download uh, initRD and kernel. This, again, can happen over HTTP or uh, TFTP. Um, in our case, we just decided to go for TFTP because we want to use the same flow. Um, then the network boot, pro boot program will, um, will just basically chain lo like start, uh, load the initRD in memory, load the kernel in memory, and just start it. So TFTP is pretty old. It's like 30 years plus protocol from 1981. But hey, I am from 1981 as well. So that's a picture of me around two years old. So it's as old as, as, old as me. Um, and this is a diagram showing the protocol in high level. So the client uh, will connect over UDP to port 69, will uh, ask for a file. The server will, uh, will basically allocate a random uh, source port for the packet being sent back to the client. In this case, the port is like Y in the picture. Uh, it's basically the, as soon as you send an RRQ request, you get back the first chunk of data. By default, it's a very small block size of 512 bytes, which is ridiculous. And we're going to see about the problems connected to that. Um, but basically, every time you receive a chunk of data, you send back an acknowledgement with an integer sig signifying the next uh, block you want. And you know, conversation happens like this. It's a lockstep uh, algorithm. Basically, you can't have the next chunk until you acknowledge the previous one. Um, and basically, the last packet, uh, so the end of the session is, is uh, indicated by uh, the size of the last block. If the, the last block is uh, less than the, the block size, then the, uh, the, the session is over. Uh, yeah, if, if a packet is lost on the network, uh, the client will resend the previous acknowledged to get the, um, the data packet back. And there are a number of retries after which the, the device will, will give up. And you know, when I say the, pro the default block size is ridiculously small, and you know, this can cause problems. For example, if you have a pop somewhere, like on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, oh, OK, I, I put it in North Korea, but we don't have a pop in North Korea, OK? <laughs> but anyway, so if you have a pop in, like, somewhere in Asia, and uh, back, in, back in 2014, we used to, we didn't have any TFTP server in POPs, so we needed to connect to the closest uh, origin or data center, in this case, Oregon, in Oregon. If you have a big, relatively big file, like 80 megabytes, or for example, an init RD, which is 80 megabytes, and you need to download that with the default block size. With 150 millisecond latency, yeah, it will take you 12 hours to do that, right? Even if you double the block size, to 1400, it will take you five hours or 4.5. 4 this is not a, like this is not a problem in the data center itself because you have sub millisecond latency. So you know, worst case, you just wait around one minute. But so, but this is a great great problem on um, on you know in the pops. Um, so this is one problem. The other so in 2014 uh, we had this deployment structure. Um, you can take the diagram on the right, and you can just copy paste this diagram for every cluster we had. So every cluster was a contained like, TFTP installation. Uh, we used to have physical uh, hardware load, load balancers. They were exposing a VIP, like a TFTP VIP, for every server in the cluster, um, and we just were using the you know the standard IS you know the standard open source like TFTP daemon you find in any any Linux distribution. We had this uh, active standby configuration. Um, and then our like we needed to sync uh, around seven gigabytes of stuff because we had many initRD, many kernels, many Cisco you know images and stuff like that. So every time you were deploying one of these, you need to sync seven gigabytes and keep it in sync. Then we have our you know Python automation to uh, provision bare metal, and this automation needed to be aware of which of the two instances was active. So it was a bit of a pain. And any of those uh, things in the picture can fail. So you know, the the problems with these are physical load balances, waste of resource because we had one machine in, in a cluster just doing nothing, and for every cluster we had this pair of hosts that were basically doing nothing. We could maybe go with like a few a few uh, tens of them per, per data center or something. So it was a waste of resource. 
And yeah, the automation needs to be aware of which one was active. We didn't have any stats back then. We tried uh, tailing the, uh, the TFTP daemon log files, but uh, we found out that after like three weeks, uh, it was just stopping, stopping like logging. I didn't want to go into the C code to fix it. Um, and as I said before, TFTP is very bad uh, protocol in high latency environments. Yeah, and I said it before, too many, too, mo too many moving parts, and each one of them can fail. So how we di did we solve these problems? So in general, we like to use open source as much as, as we can, but sometimes it doesn't work. So we try to you know, come up with our own solution, and sometimes we can't open source the result, sometimes we do. And in this case, I decided to do it, and it's in GitHub. So we wrote a framework. Uh, to uh, write, so basically a framework to build dynamic TFTP servers. Um, it supports only RRQ, so the fetch requests, there is no write support. If you're using TFTP for writing, just stop it, don't do it. <laughs> and uh, it supports the main TFTP uh, specifications. So the main one, and then also other extensions like uh, the negotiation of the block size, negotiation of uh, the timeout intervals, and other stuff. And it, it is extensible, that means you can in, it can import the framework, uh, override a few classes, and you can define your own logic. And you can also define some callbacks that will be called by the server to push your own statistics to your own infrastructure, like monitoring infrastructure, or alerting infrastructure, whatever it is. Um, this is an overview of how the framework works. There is a client, it sends a RRQ request and there is a base class called, ba called base server. This class basically implements the UDP acceptor for any new connection to do some parsing of the connection. And after that, it will fork into a new uh, process. And we basically just call get handler, which is a method that returns a base handler, which is a base object to, that deals with the session, basically, with the client. The base handler itself will uh, call a method called get response data which returns an object. This object is a file-like object, so you, it implements a open, read, and sides, just like a normal file, would, normal, normal file object would do. And the base handler will use this object to fetch block of data from, from this object and basically communicate with the client and basically implement the, the protocol. When the session is over, your callback that you provided in the constructor will be executed, which will give you standard counters but you can you know, add your own counters and make your own logic to push your stats to your infrastructure. And the server does the same. The base server does the same in intervals that you can configure as well. So in the GitHub uh, readme, actually in the Git, GitHub project, there is an example directory you can look at with the simple server, with the simplest, simplest server you can write, like a, a server that re, um, serves file from, the, from a root directory in the file system. This, this is basically just the example you find in the GitHub repo. Um, so first thing you need to do, so as I said, see, as I said before, you have this uh, f uh, f uh, response data file object. What you do is you inherit, can you read the code? Uh, sorry, <laughs> of course. Uh, you can, you, can um, so you need to inherit from this object and implement, uh, implement read, sides, and close. In this case, it's a very simple object, just, it, it's just a wrapper around the file object, but can be anything, like think about configuration files that you have to generate dynamically, right? You can just write whatever you want here, but the interface has to be a file-like object. So you do that, then, then you implement the static render, which here is just uh, basically just inheriting the base object, calling the constructor, and then exposing the root directory and a path, which you need to pass to the get response data uh, method, which returns the, the object we declared in the previous slide. So very easy. For the base server, you do something similar. Actually, I forgot that uh, in the constructor at the top, you 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 have to do you know to declare an argument for the for the um, the statistics uh, callback. You basically do the same for the static server. You you inherit the server, call the constructor, expose you know initialize the root, initialize the handler stats callback, and then you just uh, override get handler to return the object we declared in the previous slide. And this is the main. You have the top two functions are your callbacks. You get stats, which is a dictionary of statistics, and you can do whatever you want with it. And 
use your internal libraries to push counters to your inter to your uh, monitor infrastructure, and it, it just uh, initializes the server, and it, then you just call the run method, and, and that's it. So how do we use it in Facebook? Uh, so in Facebook, a while ago, like two or three years ago, we decided to get rid of hardware load balancers, and we have our own software load balancer architecture, which is based on Linux IPVS, which is a kernel stuff, but the control panel is Python. So we have Python uh, to control uh, uh, IPVS via Netlink API. So everything, like, all, like we basically use Python with some IPVX stuff in Linux. So we, got, we decided to get, get rid of the hardware load balancers, so we use the software one. So what I did, we did is, um, we have a population of TF FB TFTP servers in every region. Any server can uh, respond uh, to requests coming from any client. What we do is we implement our own logic on top of the framework to stream this stuff from the closest HTTP repository. So we don't need to synchronize seven gigabytes of files anymore. What we do is if uh, something is, is not on local cache, we uh, we, what we do is we fetch the, the, the file, the static file from HTTP, but we don't wait for the fetch to finish. We just start streaming bytes. We don't wait for 80 megabytes or whatever it is to land on the disk and then we serve it. Um, so every time there is a new request, we do an HTTP uh, head request to, to the HTTP server to, make, you know, to, check, to get the timestamp of the file. If it's new, we just start this streaming process again. Otherwise, we serve it from the, file, from, uh, from the disk. Yeah. And we have, so w when a request comes in, we have regular expressions. We have regular expressions. If it matches a static file, we do what I just said. So we stream it from the closest HTTP repo. If it's a dynamic request, like configuration file, we make some backend calls to our backend systems to get the information we need to build the file response object, which is dynamically generated, and we serve the response back to the clients. So what are the improvements here? As I said, no more physical load balancers. No waste of resource. Any machine can serve traffic from everywhere. We have stats finally with you know, fancy dashboard and everything. The TFTP servers are dynamic. They don't need any. They are sta stateless servers, basically. Uh, no conf so the config files for grab IPX are automatically generated, and, and the static files are streamed. And yeah, of course, you don't need to synchronize 7 gig gigs of data every time you deploy a new server. And because of this, it's container friendly. We can just take the binary, put it in a container, and it will just you know, run. But I said that um, we removed load balancers completely. So how, did we, how do we you know, route TFTP traffic? So DHCP is the guy that knows, tells the machines which IP they need to connect to to find the TFTP server. Um, so what, what we do is basically we have a project called NetNarad, which is actually, uh, it was uh, recently, you can find it like an article on our blog about it. Uh, NetNarad is kind of, it's not really 100% Python, it's Python and C++, but uh, the, the goal of this project is to ping every rack switch in the fleet from, every, from different locations on the fleet in order to find latencies and packet loss. And what it produces ultimately, it's, a, it's like a huge JSON map file, which tells you the latencies between cluster X and cluster Y in the infrastructure. So we have this huge JSON that gets published every couple of minutes, and application can subscribe to this JSON file. So what DHCP, the DHCP server, which actually I talked about last year in SRECON, um, it's our own implementation of a DHCP server. It will fetch this uh, map combine it with the location from which the client is arriving, and also combining that with the health checks that we have internally to, to know uh, which TFTP servers are, um, are enabled, so are alive. So we combine this information, and we just decide, that we, we just pick the closest TFTP server to a given client. So we use this map uh, of our network to do that. And this helps a lot with POPs, right? So now we, what we do is we deploy TFTP, the FB TFTP implementation in every single POP. So we reduce the TFTP latency because it, it stays inside the same uh, location, and we stream the stuff from, the, from over the ocean. So TFTP, we, don't, we no longer have these TFTP issues we were having back in 2014. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. 
you can find the project uh, in GitHub. You can install with pip, and you know we have a session tomorrow at 2:45 uh, p.m. about how we use Python uh, in production engineering at Facebook. So if you want to talk to us, just free, feel free to come over, and now I'll take some questions. Hola, hola. One question. Hi. Uh, how much faster is it comparing to the previous uh, TFTP? Can, can you say that again? Sorry? How fast is it comparing how fast it is? Uh, so compared to the it's not So it's not faster because that's C, C implementation. This is Python with multiprocess. I did some benchmark. Unfortunately, legal didn't want me to <laughs> put the benchmarks on the slides, but it is not as fast as the C implementation, but it works quite well with our... Uh, Infrastructure, so we can do. We did like we do okay, every quarter, I think. Yeah, we, every quarter we do mass provisioning tests where we take a full cluster, we drain it, and we mass provision this cluster with tens of thousands of machines, and it just can cope with tens of thousands of machines. So that, yeah. So it's to respond to your question, it's not as fast as the C implementation, but it's fast for us. It's good for us. Another. Can it work on some network hardware instead of? Yeah, yeah. So potentially, if you have a Python interpreter, it can it can absolutely work. Um, like I don't know if you know, but we have a, a open computer rack switch. Sorry, <laughs> open <laughs> open computer rack switches, which basically are Linux boxes with the ASIC you know ASIC hardware in them, and they run like a normal Linux uh, system. So potentially, you can have. FP, TFP deployed in every rack switch and just be able to save that rack switch. So that, yeah, you can, you can do that. I mean, if you can run an interpreter in your network device, then you, you can. So it's Python 3, there's no, it's pure Python 3, there's no, there's no dependencies on anything. So I don't have the problem of compiling the C TFTP server on the switch? Yeah, so you don't have that problem. You can just, just run it with Python and it, it just uses sockets and uh, multiprocessing, and that's it. And maybe if you, yeah, if you need to do what we do, like the streaming stuff, you need an HTTP library, but you can use the embedded, you know, the the library in the in the interpreter in the, the default Python distribution. So. Okay. What? <clears throat> okay. Thank you, engineer. For thank you. Sorry for the technical problems. <laughs> <laughs> for you. Thank you for your interesting conference, and thank you very much to you for coming. Have a nice day. Thank you.